Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, um, the ACT and Region Chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. I'd like to open with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the tra traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respects to any Aboriginal and Torres, and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. Welcome to the ACT and Region Chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association's presentation by Dr. Rodney Ubrahim. Shortly, I'll introduce Rodney, but first, some housekeeping. Please stay muted uh, throughout the presentation uh, and for bandwidth considerations, you may consider turning off your video. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat and we will ask them at the end of the procession. The session today will be recorded and I will make available and I'll make it available uh, in the next couple of days, usually, usually within 24 hours. Next, introductions. Um, Rodney is a data analyst in the, uh, for citizen science projects working within the ACT government uh, Environment Planning and Sustainability Directorate. Over to you, Rodney. Yep. Okay, thanks for the introduction, John. Thanks for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, even though it's been done, I'd like to start the presentation by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the country, which we meet their continuing connection to the land and respect for the uh, elders past, present, emerging. Um, as John's introduced, I'm going to speak about my role um, citizen science in the ACT region, specifically with the ACT government, but a bit of background to that role myself and um, what I do and hopefully what I may be able to do for some of the projects. Uh, so as an outline of the presentation, I'll give a background and a bit of a background of myself. And seeing as it's a talk of scientific interest, I'll focus on my science career and I'll speak a little bit about my role with the ACT government, run through some of the citizen science projects that I've been involved in, noting that the project managers of these programs know a lot more than I do, but hopefully I can provide some informative background around them. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, touch a little bit on the citizen science government interface in the ACT area. Um, I suppose I, I started in science as a very mature age student in 2008, where I did a Bachelor of Applied Science at the University of Canberra. And I got really interested in environmental chemistry while I was doing that and went on to do an honours program at the University of Canberra, looking at intertidal gastropods as bioindicators of metal contamination. Um, I was really interested in how metals or how contaminants in the environment affect organisms, looking at exposure dose response relationships, how organisms respond to those metals, and looking at some stable isotope analysis to work out how some contaminants actually move through organisms and provide evidence uh, that that's happening. Um, so I completed honours and enjoyed that area so much that I went and continued working with snails once again as a PhD project. My PhD thesis was titled uh, The Response of Isodorella New Combi to Copper Exposure, an Integrative Approach um, Using Biochemical Life History and Transcriptomic Markers to Develop a Mechanistic Understanding of Response. It's quite a mouthful, but really I exposed snails over three generations to copper. And the reason that I wanted to do this is it's a little endemic Australian snail that lives out in the rice fields. Um, it uh, estivates in the soil in between rice crops. And when the rice is sown, it comes up out of the soil, uh, eats lots of the roots of the rice plants and significantly reduces yield. Um, and the best treatment in Australia for this is to throw copper into the rice fields on a regular basis. Uh, as an inorganic contaminant, copper is going to build up in the environment. So I was interested to see whether these organisms would develop 
resistance. Um, uh, so I studied that um, for my PhD. Uh, it was a really interesting topic. At the end of my PhD, um, I was really lucky that a postdoctoral opportunity came up at the University of Canberra. Um, so in 2017, I started as a postdoc at the University of Canberra, and I've been there ever since, and I still work there part-time alongside my ACT government job, where I work uh, looking at the cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Tuggeranong and urban stormwater, uh, looking at things like hydrology, nutrient cycles, cyanobacteria, what drives cyanobacteria blooms, how cyanobacteria can be controlled. It's lots of uh, things also about stormwater movement and the contamination uh, moving through especially urban systems and lake systems. Um, so from a scientific background, um, gives you a, a bit of an idea where I come from. But as, I've also always had an interest in data analysis. When lots of other students found data analysis the most boring topic possible, I always had an interest in from the time I did undergrad, I mentored students in data analysis while I was, while I was an undergrad and immediately started tutoring when I finished my undergraduate studies. So I've got an interest in data analysis. Um, while I was going through my PhD and honours, I worked on a number of other projects in my own time. And I suppose I was able to publish a couple of papers because of data analysis involvement in other, in other projects, which um, is really useful. But I just thought I'd throw that in because it demonstrates a, a link to data analysis back through uh, my time in science. As soon as we're focusing on citizen science, because so far all my experience has been outside of citizen science, um, I'm a citizen scientist in the ACT, involved specifically with the Water Watch and Frog Watch programs, and um, I think this was the September Water Watch sampling with a few of my little helpers. So, um, towards the middle of last year, an opportunity came up with the ACT government as a citizen science data analyst. And it was really appealing to me. As I said, I've been involved with those citizen science projects and I haven't been involved with them for a long time, but I was aware of the projects and most of the passionate people that get involved in these citizen science projects. Um, so it was a really appealing opportunity the citizen science aspect and also the data analysis aspect. Um, when I applied for the position, um, the main... Rod, were you intending to share a presentation? Absolutely. Is there not a presentation sharing? Not at the moment. Hmm. I apologise. Let me... That's right, Rob. We've been seeing, looking at your face, which has been very entertaining. Oh, that's, I could Im just imagine how entertaining that would be. Uh, can you see a presentation now? We can now. It's in, um, it's in PowerPoint. Let, let me, that's I apologise that you've had to view my face up until now. I hope the presentation makes better viewing from here on in. Um, so can you see the... Uh, the presentation view now? Yes, presentation view, the slides title. And I'm going to go back because that's where I, I should have been at. Yeah. 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 Apologies for that. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, the position at the ACT government was advertised around experimental, helping with experimental design in citizen science project, especially looking at, at fit for purpose data and projects that fit with government data needs, data analysis assistance, assisting with the analysis of data from citizen science project. But I think also, and hopefully increasingly so, advocacy for citizen science project and the use of citizen science within the ACT government around policy, planning and decision-making. 
Um, I've been in the role now about five months. I suppose the first thing I say is I'm very much still learning. I'm still learning about the ACT government's data requirements um, in the Environment Planning and Sustainable, Sustainable Development Directory because they're quite broad and diverse. I'm still learning about lots of the citizen science projects, um, especially uh, gaining an in-depth knowledge. But putting these things together, I'm still very much learning about the opportunities there for integration of citizen science projects with the government's data needs. And hopefully I can touch a little bit on that tonight and some opportunities. So um, I wanted to mention some of the projects that I've been involved with so far in my relatively short time in the role. I suppose before I do, I should make it clear that all these projects have people that have ownership, who have developed the projects, managed the projects, and know lots more about them than I do. I'm going to touch on what happens in some of the projects. But, um, I'm by no means the authority on any of them. There's people who know a lot more. Um, but to the list of the main projects I've been involved with so far, I've had a little bit involvement with Canberra Nature Map, and I'm sure most of you are aware of Canberra Nature Map. It's a super valuable project. Um, it maps the, the presence and distribution of lots of flora and fauna in the ACT region um, and provides lots of valuable data on distributions and a whole lot more. Um, uh, frogs and turtles. Oh, I suppose I should also let you know, I'm just going to give a brief overview of a few of the programs and then I'll go more in depth on just a few of them. So frogs and turtles in the urban environment, um, looking at how some amphibious uh, and aquatic organisms use the waterways and move around in the matrix of urban development uh, around the streams, waterways and ponds that they use. Um, response of mountain galaxias to bushfire. I won't touch on this now because I'm going to go into it a little bit more in just a minute. Um, platypus months. Platypus months has had huge uptake, and there's been some really valuable data collected on the district on the distribution of platypus and the abundance of platypus in certain areas um, that I've had the pleasure to work with. Uh, the small ant blue butterfly project um, and links to coconut ants. Again, I won't touch on that here because I'm about. I'll speak about that more fully in a minute. Um, the superb parrot project. Uh, as a project that I've um, been helping out a little bit with organisation of data so far, where superb parrot hollows um, have been monitored and again, providing really valuable data on um, endangered species in their, in their ACT. Um, the Veg Watch program, monitoring lots of vegetation patches, uh, responses to different management, such as weeding um, and fire regimes, as again, a project that's produced some valuable data. And the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch Program, uh, which again, I won't go into because I'll speak about it more in a minute. So I'll go now a little bit more in depth into four of these projects. Um, and I've chosen projects at different stages of development. Um, and hopefully from different areas. So there might be something of interest for everyone. So the first one I wanted to speak about was um, the Galaxid or Mountain Galaxia's response to fire. And this is a project that we're just developing now. And it's built off a project that was destroyed or that the objectives couldn't be followed through after the 2020 fire. There was a project that was being developed in the conservation research area where they were looking at the effects of prescribed burn intensity on the mountain galaxid population to feed into uh, management burning um, and determine what appropriate levels of burning were and how they were affecting some of these stream communities um, up around the Nace Valley area. But the 2020 fires came through and 
as opposed to having an experimental design that had some control sites, some sites that had been burned and some sites that were planned to be burned that allow a nice data comparison, are great areas um, of the proposed experimental area were burnt. So it kind of removed the baseline to have a controlled study. Um, I've looked at the before data and I suppose it's, it's a little bit of an unusual situation to have such nice before data, but not after. So um, based on having this before data and trying to make some use of it, we want to go out towards the end of March or April and collect some data on the abundance um, and distribution of galaxids in these burnt areas where we've got pre-data to determine whether there's been a change in the populations. Um, and also potentially if there has been a change, extend the study and look at whether there's a recovery of the populations over time, as well as purely looking at the galaxid populations, um, look at some stream characteristics, and the catchment condition around that. So we've got some explanatory variables to explain what's going on. Um, this is a site where we're out in, uh, this is in the mid Nace River. And it's amazing at the moment how much the stream condition, the stream morphology has changed with such big sand slugs moving down. Um, and there's lots of sand, both in the streams and rivers, but also in the valleys moving down to them. Um, so you know, there's potential for this project to be really interesting and informative. Um, when I said the project's developing, we haven't got volunteers for this project as yet. It'll involve five days sampling at 20 sites in the Upper Nace Valley, um, preferably staying in the park to avoid travel backwards and forwards in between. So this is a project that's really early stages, but if there's anyone interested tonight, I would be really pleased, feel free to get in contact with me at some stage after the presentation. Um, uh, I've touched on this, but the expected outcomes of this presentation are to expect, understand the response and recovery of the galaxid populations to fire in these upper reaches which may provide some input to fire management strategy. And while it wasn't planned this way when the data was initially collected, that's a rare opportunity to assess these things because there's some nice before data that can feed um, into the project. Uh, the next project I wanted to touch on was uh, frogs and turtles in urban areas. Um, Obviously, frogs and turtles, our waterways, everywhere and rely on our waterways. Um, an interest going in urban ecology. And obviously, our streams are often concrete channels in urban areas. There's lots of fragmentation, barriers, um, movement from a natural state that will affect how these organisms or these animals use the waterways in urban areas. There's also differing habitat requirements for different animals. Um, so uh, Bruno, uh, who you can see explaining in the picture here, and Anka Maria developed a, a project on the frogs and turtles in urban areas. And when I say the frogs and turtles may use the um, waterways different, I suppose there's a different matrix and while the frogs may use the matrix around the pond and the habitat around the pond may be important for turtles, connectivity between ponds and waterways may be really important. So uh, Bruno and Anka Maria have been collecting data each month since September, and they will finish data collection for this year in March. Data collection has been, um, at four ponds in the inner north of Canberra and four ponds at West Belconnen. Um, this is a picture of the inner north ponds. And as you can see, um, 
the ponds sit within a highly developed urban area, um, which would obviously impact the way that the animals are using this environment and their ability to move from point to point in the environment. Um, as opposed to, this is an overview of the four ponds at West Belconnen. And while they, they sit in a peri-urban environment on the urban fringe, so it's a, um, while it's in or at the edge of a developed environment, it, um, it's a very different habitat and matrix around the ponds to what there is in that inner north area. And um, Bruno and Anka Maria are very interested in the effect of this on the way the frogs and turtles use these systems. Um, and preliminary results indicate there's three times more turtles collected in the West Belconnen wetlands compared to the inner north wetlands, but there's still lots of capture or recapture data to be analysed and the frog data uh, yet to be analysed. But I think this is a really interesting project, um, especially in the context of Canberra's development. I think there's currently a push for lots of, of for less expansion and lots of infill development. And our understanding of the effect of that development on the whole environment, but in this case, urban water, waterways, is really important um, with the infill planning. Um, this project at this stage is a one year project, but uh, they hope to get funding and make it a longer term study, which I think would provide some really valuable results. And it fits with some ACT Gov, I believe it fits with some ACT government data requirements. Um, the next project I'd like to speak about is the small ant blue butterfly project. So the small ant blue butterfly is listed as critically endangered in Victoria and it's very, it's widespread, very rare across its white range. A lot of data, there's not a lot of data on the species. It's found in woodland and open forest. Um, it's a cryptic species, but it has a really important relationship to the coconut ant. It has an obligate relationship where the caterpillars of the small ant blue butterfly live in the ant nests. Um, they provide nutrients to the ants, they live in the ant nest and they feed on the ant brood um, through that uh, caterpillar larval stage. The eggs are always laid close to coconut ant nests, but small ant blue butterflies, we know they're rare, but they're not present at all coconut ant nest sites. Um, there can be some coconut ant sites that are apparently very similar to ones with small ant blue breeding colonies that don't have small ant blue breeding colonies, which raises the question, if you want to manage this species, what is important for the small ant blue butterflies in coconut ant sites? Um, so uh, yeah, so I suppose the question is what makes a coconut ant site suitable as a small ant blue breeding site? Um, and Michael, uh, who I noticed um, here tonight uh, is um, leading or a major player in this project. And we're looking at colony size of the coconut ant sites, the vegetation characteristics around the site, what other insects, um, such as meat ants or homoptera, which the, um, which the coconut ant requires, or other habitat characteristics which might affect whether the coconut ant sites are being used as small ant breeding sites to determine what those key differences are, or in fact, if there is key differences, and what's the reason the small ant blue butterflies Use some sites, but not others where coconut ants are present. Um, the benefits of this study 
are around generally providing more information on cryptic species, but understanding their habitat requirements, potentially being able to manage the coconut ant sites so that they are useful small ant breeding sites, around development guidelines and development of land, which are fire management, and the general conservation of these sites. So there's plenty of ways that this project is gathering really important uh, information that can feed into ACT government objectives. Um, the last project I wanted to touch on is the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch Program. Um, and some background of this project program. It's a Water Watch was a national program established in 1990, in the 1990, sorry, as a water quality monitoring program. But lots of areas experienced difficulty when national funding dropped off. And this lots of Water Watch projects in various areas um, ceased to exist, with Victoria remaining a stronghold. ACT and some areas in Sydney. Um, in the Canberra area or in the upper Murrumbidgee area, the Water Watch program provides lots and lots of valuable data, monitors catchment health through monitoring 243 sites with monthly water quality data, uh, macroinvertebrate assessment at these sites on an annual basis, and riparian condition assessment in the reaches at least every two years. So I suppose what's important to focus on here is it's not just purely water quality, it's a catchment health program that provides some really valuable information. But like I touched on earlier, lots of water watch projects went through difficulty when national funding dropped off. And I think, um, there's some lessons to be learnt from this for citizen science projects. When the funding dropped off, the ACT or the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch went through various difficult times, but responded with reviewing their procedures, ensuring there was a focus on data quality, as well as community engagement. Previously, the project been seen as community engagement by lots of people. So focus on data review was done at University of Canberra. Um, a review of the quality assurance and quality control procedures to make sure that the data being produced by the program was of quality that could be used um, and confidently used by anyone to determine catchment health, which required some refinement of methods um, and, I suppose, importantly, a QAQ procedure that could recognise where methods required re refinement. There was developments of, it's like the CHIP report, which has become a really valuable indicator of catchment health and water quality in the whole ACT region, um, making that data readily available to people. And also a change from reflecting individual sites to reach data. An individual site produces its own information and previously the Water Watch program, or historically the Water Watch program reported data from individual sites. However, there's large areas of river with similar, similar um, habitat, similar qualities and similar land uses that can be grouped. And they found that there was much more value in reporting data at a reach level that reflected the land use, the types of habitat, what was going on that section or that reach of the streams and rivers, rather than purely uh, individual sites. And there's been a focus of um, data alignment with requirements where possible. Um, yeah, so, um, the Water Watch program produces now lots of valuable data. It's broadly used by 
the ACT government for a number of reasons. Uh, okay, so now I just want to finish with a little bit of a section on citizen science and the government and what in the ACT region and what I've learned in my short time um, and some background around that. So obviously the government um, in the environmental area has a need for a wide range of data for policy, planning, management decisions on an ongoing basis. In Canberra, we also have a really knowledgeable and enthusiastic um, citizen science um, community who collect data on lots of different things. In some cases, these are brought together. And in some cases, there's a want to bring these together. In some cases, there may, may not be. But I'm interested in when and how we can bring these together when there's one. And I acknowledge that some projects or some programs want to collect data that aren't used in this way. And I have no problem with that. Um, and also, there can be a two-way resistance and reluctance uh, because I also fully understand that citizen scientists own their data, they manage their data, and they deserve respect. And it's important that that's acknowledged in the other direction as well. So thinking about citizen science and the policy cycle. I, um, I looked at the latest State of the Environment report, and I'm going to touch on some more outcomes from that in, in a minute, but there was, this, um, there was this figure that looked at the citizen science and how it fits with this policy cycle. And from a citizen science program perspective, three areas. Um, have come up that's required to, for citizen science projects to inform policy um, and play an important role in the policy cycle. And that's scientific excellence, having good data that's fit for purpose, um, that suits the program, uh, that, that suits the government requirements. And I think in lots of the ACT government or ACT area citizen science project, this isn't a problem. Citizens engagement. And again, fortunately, I think we've got a really strong engaged citizen science community that's only growing and policy relevance. I think there's lots of data that's collected that's policy relevant. I think at this stage, some of it's aligned and, and some of it isn't, but that's an area that could potentially be worked on. So this is a, a little quote and I went back and had a look at the State of the Environment Report and it's littered with mentions of citizen science, the importance of citizen science. Um, I couldn't cut and paste them all. I'm not going to read the first bit, but I think the second bit encapsulates a lot of um, lots of things that are in that plan. Important management plans and strategies have been caucused, designed, reviewed, updated, discussed with and informed by citizen scientists. And I think throughout the whole document, but in that statement, there's a recognition that there's a really important role for citizen science to play, where there's programs who want to feed into the government policy, um, planning and decision-making interface. Um, and again, from the State of the Environment report, there was a few case studies put in there that I think are really strong recognition of the, the light that citizen science is viewed within the government. So this one's on Brown Tree Creek for populations, but I think it reflects more broadly on lots of data that Canberra Nature Map, Canberra Ophologist Group, or Ornithologist Group, sorry, and a number of um, groups collect that's really valuable in understanding the presence of species, their distributions, um, invasive species, and threatened species, data that's really essential to environmental planning and decision-making in the ACT region. Um, again, from that state of the environment report, when I went to the water section, central, the first thing, 
that comes up in the open analysis is the CHIP, the catchment health indicator program, or the, the key results from the catchment health indicator program of the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch. And this is used to inform on water quality, riparian vegetation assessment, macro environment, uh, macro invertebrate community assessment, but more broadly, catchment health. And it's used as a key indicator for the ACT government. Again, really important in understanding and informing ACT government policy and planning. Um, so I think currently, Within the ACT government, there's lots of value being gained from citizen science and uh, this other thank you because you contribute lots, but there's still a genuine want to continue to integrate further citizen science data into planning and policy decisions and look for opportunities where there's potential to align citizen science programs with government data requirements um, and collection of data that's fit for purpose. Um, so I think there's strong use of the data there, but I still think there's lots of opportunities. Um, but as I, I look at this talk as a bit of a chance for an introduction um, to the citizen scientists involved with the Canberra group of the Citizen Science Association. Um, what can I do? I'm happy to discuss any experimental designs, data analysis issues, and general questions about citizen science within the ACT government. I may not have the answer, but don't have the answer. I'll do my best to get the answer for you. I'm happy to take any questions about alignment of citizen science with the ACT government. Again, I may need to take some of them on notice. Um, and I'll support citizen science where I can and be a strong advocate for it within the government where I can. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. That's, yeah, um, that's what I've got tonight. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much, Rod. Um, I've, has anyone got any questions? If so, if they'd like to enter them into the, um, the chat function. Uh, one that I've sort of occurred to me while you were going through, Rod, and I'll sort of lead off with that. Um, the Upper Murrumbidgee stretches across more than just the ACT. How is it a sort of a sensitive question when they start, you know, whether it's funded by the ACT government and you, you're working in New South Wales or, or things like that? Yeah. I don't, yeah, look, that's a good question. And I don't have an absolute answer, but my take in the Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch, um, there's a Cooma region included. There's a gas region included and water is monitored or water quality catchment health, I should say more broadly, is monitored in those areas outside of the ACT. I don't have access to all the, the spreadsheets and financials and where the money comes, but there's certainly a lot of ACT effort in those areas too. And I, and I think when you think of waters and streams, uh, environmental boundaries uh, are less clear than government boundaries. And I think to think that you can control water quality in ACT without controlling water quality or without considering water quality above is an interesting proposition. But also, I think we're a progressive community in the ACT and interested in the environment. And I think we also recognise there's a need to not provide or send contaminated water downstream. So, yeah, from my perspective, no, there is no problems with those outside Canberra areas. Um, yeah, uh, and I, yeah, I think the program is strong across the region, not within the government political boundary. Fair enough. Um, a question from, uh, from uh, Michael. Um, he says, Rod, I see the, your main supportive role for citizen scientists uh, as being a sounding board for data collection methods and how this data uh, can be uh, analysed to answer questions being asked. Could you expand on this support? Yeah, okay. So 
I suppose, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have, as I, uh, I suppose, said at the start of the presentation, I've got a little bit of history of data analysis, experimental design around that, everything. I'm in, on Monday, I work for the ACT government in this role on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, I am happy to talk to anyone around experimental design, analysis of the data um, associated with citizen science projects, but also if there's data, um, I suppose, and there's programs that may fit ACT government requirements, how, what the data requirements were and how they can be aligned. So um, my number, my email address, I don't know whether my last slide is still showing, yes. It's still up there, yeah. My email address there, my phone number is there, and that phone number goes through to my mobile, so it's pretty much um, on all the time. Yeah, so anyone who wants any advice on any of those things, I can't promise to be able to answer all your questions on the spot, but I'm really happy to talk to anyone who would like advice in those areas. And, yeah, uh, it would be great to have... Um, some contact after this presentation if anyone's got any questions or need any help. So, yeah, that, that answers the question. Yep. Um, we, Deb um, from Waterwatch, uh, Rod has uh, come in and said that the Cooma region for Waterwatch is funded by Icon Water and the ACT government funds the rest, including Malongolo Catchment, which is two thirds of in New South Wales. Yeah, thank you. I was, yeah, yep. No, um, yeah, yep. Deb's a very, yeah, well, catchment coordinator and a very um, important contributor to Water Watch. I was a little bit worried speaking in front of some of the people who are highly involved in these projects, including Deb and Michael, that I might make a mistake. I hope I haven't, but yeah, that's great. Thank you for providing that information, Deb. They might give you any corrections in um, behind the scenes. Yeah, so. absolutely. I'm not. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So I will take. What, I'll take them gladly and hope I can improve on the feedback. <laughs> one one of the projects you talked about was the and I'm going to mispronounce it. Galax Galaxy. Yeah. The, the mountain, little fish. Mountain Galaxy is up in up in the upper nice catchment. Yeah. Yep. You in, you indicated that you're looking for volunteers. Um, have you got any more? sort of information around what would be involved? Are we looking at a uh, uh, something that youth might be able to get involved with over say a school holidays type process or what? I think so. Um, I have them, yeah, so full disclosure, I have a meeting with some of the conservation research people who collected the before data and that meeting is a Monday afternoon and I'm ready to go with the project and try and get volunteers. But what I really want is I'm not, a, I'm not a fish ecologist and they used particular methods when they went up and catch and um, collected the pre-data. So why some of the conservation research people are gonna come out at least for a day or two of the data collection to show us, uh, or to demonstrate and make sure we're using consistent methods and everything. So I will have more information. I think from a school perspective, I think it will depend on the timings around that because I rely on those people um, being there to help us out. So I can certainly, I don't know whether there's an avenue um, for me to send out a bulk email after the presentation, uh, sorry, after my meeting next Monday, if I've got some more information on timing and what the volunteer role would engage but I'd be happy to do that if that would be interest, John. I can certainly pass information to those that are um, have participated yeah. in tonight's session. Yeah. Um, the yeah. So Mike, Michael's just noted that um, uh, he says, Rod, have any government workers approached you yet to help in projects from citizen scientists? Yeah. Um, as in, so I'm just whether any government workers have volunteered or um, 
Yeah, I'm not positive of the question. I've certainly had um, some good chats with especially the conservation research people and the um, the science strategy, the ACT government science strategy has just been released and there's, um, I've had some good talks around that about integration, but I'm not quite sure if that's what Michael's getting to. He's, he's updated his question to indicate that he's wanting to see if there's, uh, whether they're looking to engage with citizen scientists. Yeah, I, look, I, I think, um, yeah, there has been, I've had several discussions with um, people in senior positions, and I think there is a strong focus to engage in citizen science generally across the directorate. I will, oh, I don't, yeah, I, 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 th I think that's generally the feeling. That strength of that willingness to engage varies between people. And I think I mentioned when I was discussed the Water Watch project, I think one of the battles with the Water Watch project earlier, and I wasn't there for the battle, but I've heard some stories, is getting people to accept the data and things like that. I think lots of those barriers have been overcome and I think there's a genuine willingness for people to engage. But I think it's, um, it's really important to get people to the table and talk about what data is being produced, what the data requirements are, uh, well, sorry, what data is being produced by Citizen Science Project, what data requirements are, and seeing where they can where they can come together, whether a Citizen Science Project gets tweaked a little bit because it can, um, so it can specifically meet requirements, maybe a possibility, but also just understanding from the government side of thing exactly what data has been collected and what can be used is really important. I've organised a meeting the Rog and Turtle um, project in urban areas on the way through and put a little bit of a highlight on it. I've got a meeting. I'm trying to organise a meeting between Bruno and Angela. Maria managing uh, that and some of the people who are interested in urban ecology to try and see if there's some alignment or for alignment between the data being collected from that project and the government requirements. Um, and I'm very happy to look for further opportunities to do that kind of thing. I think, like I said it in my introduction, I'm still learning and understanding where those opportunities are, but wherever I can be an advocate for citizen science um, data to be used or make connections between program managers and the people who have the specific data requirements in the ACT government, I will do my best to do that. Fair enough. I, I believe that We need more citizen science data. I'm not sure whether it's only me, Rod, but you're breaking up a little. Yeah, sorry. I, I just got a, your internet connection is unsecure on my screen. So uh, hopefully, uh, can you can you hear me clearly now? It seems to have, at least the messages seem to be yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what you missed, but I, I, yeah, I suppose I think genuinely there is a will in the government to include citizen science data where they can. And um, there's a will from me to link projects to data requirements where I can, whether it's just being a conduit of putting people together or helping people um, design experiments or design programs that will produce fit for purpose data. Fair enough. Um, on that note, unless there's some more questions from people, um, we might draw the evening to a close. I'm not seeing any. Oh, no, there's a, a, a. Aaron Rogers has just said thank you very much, Rod and John. Um, really enjoyed the talk. Um, so.
on that note, Rod, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, well, let's let's hope you get lots of lots of people wanting to come and volunteer and help and so forth. Um, <laughs> if you want to get information out to the to the group, um, by all yeah. means, if you send it through to me, I'll send it out to the group. Um, and what I've just just do now, if I may, is I've just got a little bit of advertising to do. Um, I received this afternoon a um, advice, uh, some information from a, a lady by the name of Libby Hepburn concerning um, surveys of sea urchin barren rehabilitation project down at the Maroomilla Wharf. She's looking for volunteers to go snorkeling and scuba diving and things like that, if you're interested in that. Um, she's sit setting up a meeting for Friday the 12th of February, either on location or via Zoom. Um, if you want more information on that, please um, let me know. Um, being, a, being a keen diver, I'm, I'm always happy to get in the water. But um, okay, ladies and gents, unless there's any last minute questions, um, we might say, I'll say thank you very much to Rod. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, John. It was, yeah, it was good. Hopefully there was some informative things in there. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there yeah. was. In fact, I found yeah. mention. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. So thank you very much, Rod. And thank you very much, ladies and gents. Um, we'll uh, be in touch next time. We've got a, a presentation probably, I think it's about six to eight weeks time. Okay. Thanks very much. Good night all. Good night.